And I call on Jean Freeman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, I am grateful for the opportunity to make a short statement today in relation to transvaginal mesh in NHS Scotland. I was appointed Cabinet Secretary for Health fewer than 80 days ago, but since then, this issue is amongst those to which I have given my highest attention. I expect that most of us in this chamber have either received letters from or met women who have suffered significant and life-changing complications following vaginal mesh surgery. I think all of us here would want to acknowledge the bravery of the women who have come forward to tell their story, something that would be by no means easy given their own pain, the impact on their lives and the very sensitive nature of the problem. As members will be aware, regulatory powers over medical devices is reserved to the MHRA and the UK government. But within the limits of the powers available in Scotland, progress has been made in restricting the use of mesh and improving surgical consent procedures under the guidance of my predecessors, Alec Neil and Shona Robeson. In 2014, in response to concerns about safety, the then acting chief medical officer requested that health boards suspend the use of vaginal mesh, leading to a substantial reduction in mesh implant surgeries. An independent review of the use of vaginal mesh was established and a final report was published last year. As a result of the recommendations made by the review, which are similar to those made in other reviews across the UK and further afield, a number of actions are already being taken. The development of clinical pathways are being progressed by individual health boards and also through work at a regional level. Management of patient, patients through the care pathway has been considered, including care for women who experience complications from treatment. It has been stressed that the care for each and every patient must be considered by a multidisciplinary team and that this must occur in all cases. In addition, the need to restrict the number of surgeons undertaking procedures has been highlighted to medical directors an application of existing NICE guidance relating to the minimum number of procedures to ensure sufficient experience has been advised. Healthcare Improvement Scotland has established an oversight group which is reviewing evidence and trends in procedures and reported adverse events. This will influence the nature of clinical pathways going forward and provides high level external review. The Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Catherine Calderwood, has been clear that all patients must be provided with information to help them make informed decisions about their treatment. And Scottish Government officials are working in partnership with colleagues from the Department of Health in England and the devolved nations to establish a mesh registry that will collect information on all procedures. The Chief Medical Officer has continued to keep this issue under review. Listening to the voices of women who have been affected she and I have discussed what steps would be necessary that would satisfy me that every action has been taken to ensure the NHS treatment options available are as safe as possible, irrespective of the views of the MHRA. As a result, I have today asked the Chief Medical Officer to instruct health boards to immediately halt the use of transvaginal mesh altogether in cases of both pelvic organ prolapse and stress urinary incontinence, pending the implementation of a new restricted use protocol that will ensure procedures are carried out only in the most exceptional circumstances and subject to a robust process of approval and fully informed consent. This halt in use will not affect other uses of mesh, for example, transabdominal and in hernia repair, but these are areas we will continue to keep under review. The instruction to halt is, I believe, a proportionate measure, whilst a rigorous, high vigilance, restricted use protocol for any future practice is developed and put in place. The lifting of this halt in use can only be considered once there is confidence that there is sufficient evidence that the protocol will only be triggered in only the most limited of circumstances informed by any new evidence and the forthcoming NICE guidance, which is expected in the spring of next year 
on the management of pelvic organ prolapse and stress urinary incontinence. There is one exception to this effective ban. There are currently a very small number of women who are presently waiting for a mesh procedure under the treatment time guarantee. These operations will be allowed to go ahead provided this is the woman's express wish with clear informed consent demonstrated. The Chief Medical Officer will today write to health boards to set out the high vigilance restricted use protocol to be taken forward, many elements of which are already occurring as a result of the recommendations of the independent review. The purpose of this high vigilance restricted use protocol is effectively to ensure that transvaginal mesh is not used in Scotland's NHS, except in the most exceptional circumstances where there is absolutely no clinical alternative and it is the fully informed and consented wish of the woman concerned. Subject to the evidence, should the halt be lifted, transvaginal mesh would only be available in the NHS in Scotland under this restricted use protocol, and that would require the health board's medical director, who would become the accountable officer, to consider and agree each case individually, taking account of the clinical, e the clinical evidence and subject to evidence-informed and voluntary consent from the woman. The medical director will therefore be responsible for signing off the use of transvaginal mesh on an individual named patient basis, and no transvaginal mesh will be able to be used or procured by a surgeon except under these circumstances. Even in these circumstances and with these requirements, NHS procedures would only then be permitted in a very small number of designated centres of expertise and only where the women concerned have made the choice with full information to have the procedures using transvaginal mesh. And health board directors will be responsible for ensuring that the appropriate high vigilance process is followed in each individual woman's case. Clinicians will be asked to document and retain inf confirmation of the information provided to patients, the agreement and consent of the patient, and the discussions of the multidisciplinary team assigned to the case. To ensure that documentation is given to every patient detailing their procedure, the product used, and the name of the surgeon. Document all procedures in a local or na national registry. Report all complications to Health Facilities Scotland Incident Reporting and Investigation Centre. Give patients information on how to report any complications. The Chief Medical Officer will also make clear that this high vigilance procedure must apply to all treatments for pelvic organ prolapse and stress urinary incontinence, not only when mesh is the treatment option. Finally, the Chief Medical Officer has announced a prospective audit of all procedures carried out in Scotland going forward, which will run until such time as a UK-wide registry, which I touched on earlier, is developed. In addition to the measures being taken directly by the CMO, the further NICE guidance I have already mentioned is expected to be available for consultation in October and November of this year. We will, of course, consider any additional recommendations given in this guidance when it is published and take these into account when treating women in Scotland, regardless of the treatment chosen. As the power over the approval of medical devices is a reserved one, the instruction to halt that we are instigating cannot extend beyond the bounds of NHS Scotland. Presiding officer, the measures I have set out here today are intended to underline the clear message and determination I have that our care is as safe as possible and that patients are listened to, are heard, and when confronted with decisions on their care, have the full facts available so they can make informed decisions. I want to put on record my thanks to the women who have campaigned tirelessly on this issue, and I hope that all that we have done including the additional measures I've announced today, gives them confidence that we have heard what they have said, taken their concerns seriously, and within the limits of our powers, acted. Thank you.
Thank you. I call Jackson Carlaw to be followed by Neil Findlay. Uh, can I first of all welcome the Cabinet Secretary to her post and as one of those who has been associated with this issue for a long time say I want to reflect and consider with care the statement she has just given but to say that I do welcome it. It does seem to many I hope as a decisive step on a pathway to a different approach to the whole question of MESH and I hope Elaine Holmes, Olive McElroy and all the women who will, I hope, be watching the statement this afternoon can at least give one unqualified cheer for the progress that it represents. And to do so while still recognising and paying tribute to the women who've died, Eileen Baxter and Michelle McDougall, one directly, one indirectly, of this process. It's an unhappy coincidence that it's a process that's been available since 2007, but I believe a government of any stripe with an NHS at the time would have embraced it. Only in recent times has it felt to many that in the face of the evidence have we not been pursuing the path that is now clear and singularly appropriate. So I still think there is an opportunity for the government and for this parliament to apologise to all the women across Scotland whose lives have been so irredeemably and irreversibly compromised by the whole mesh scandal. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned the MHRA. I have offered here before, and I want to repeat again, this is not an issue of devolved or reserved. It's not an issue of party politics. But I am happy, as are others in this chamber, to join with the Scottish Government in making the strongest representation to the UK Government that the MHRA has proved to be a hopelessly ineffective vehicle for considering the appropriateness of the whole mesh transplant process, implant, implant process. Can I ask, this is a high vigilance restricted use protocol. Is this a completely new procedure or is it a new protocol? I ask only to know whether this is a process that was available to the government before and it chose not to implement or whether the cabinet secretary has identified a different way forward. Alec Neil previously wrote to health boards and I know this is now within the domain of medical directors but of course that advice was set aside and not always followed in the way that the Scottish government then intended. What enforcement can the Scottish Government uh, say will be available to ensure that this, this new protocol is absolutely and rigorously implied? But finally, at least for, for today, can I say, Cabinet Secretary, well done. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. And can I thank Jackson Carlaw for uh, his comments and commend him on the wisdom of wanting time to reflect on what I've said and what he has had only a limited sight of, um, albeit earlier than I stood up to speak. Because I think this is an issue that deserves re mature reflection and continued consideration, and I'm grateful to him for that. I'm also happy to take up his offer to join with us in making representations to the MHRA. Um, my predecessor, Ms. Robeson, did write to them, uh, and we have raised that, but I'm happy to look at that again and to discuss that further with them. In terms of whether this is a new procedure or a new protocol, it's not a procedure. It is a, a protocol that is designed to put in place further steps that um, restrict the use of this procedure and of MESH in these instances uh, in a way that allows for clinical judgment, gives assurance about fully informed uh, and voluntary consent from the woman, knowing all the options that may be available to her and the consequences as best as they can be uh, anticipated of all the options available to her, but makes the medical director of a health board the accountable officer for ensuring that every step in that uh, high vigilance protocol uh, has been taken and that that triggers the use then if this, in, in those circumstances, if all of those steps have been made, that triggers then the use of MESH in those very limited circumstances. And as I said, and I keep repeating, provided the woman has given her fully informed and voluntary consent. And that is evidenced, as, as I read out. In terms of ensuring that health boards are compliant, well, of course, the, the chief medical officer has today instructed health boards to halt the use of transvaginal mesh in the two procedures I identified. We have uh, a number of steps that we can take to ensure that uh, boards are compliant uh, with uh, what I have read out today and, and previously, uh, what my predecessors also put in place. Uh, that includes, of course, the uh, engagement between the CMO and medical directors. It includes uh, the involvement of Health Improvement Scotland in these matters and looking at how boards uh, perform and what they do and it also includes 
the annual review by ministers of health boards, as well as the work that is undertaken on a regular basis between officials in uh, the health directorate and boards themselves to ensure that all of these steps are, are put in place. We will give some further thought uh, around uh, how, whether or not there is more that we can do on that, uh, but we should take uh, the time to consider uh, and hear uh, the views of those medical directors and the clinicians involved, as well as other voices. So there is a degree of uh, potential further work that we might do to ensure compliance that we too should take a bit of time to reflect on. Neil Findlay to be followed by Alison Johnson. The Cabinet Secretary makes an appeal for mature reflection, but it does uh, some it is sometimes difficult to have mature reflection when you're looking into the eyes of people whose lives have been ruined. Um, I would thank the Cabinet Secretary for the early sight of her statement. And I warmly welcome today's decision to halt the use of mesh in Scotland. This is something I and the Scottish mesh survivors have been calling for for the last six years. And had the Scottish Government acted at the time, then thousands of women would have been spared the enduring anxiety and misery of lost mobility, constant pain and ruined lives, and as we know of last week, even death. Now we know that the MHRA is not fit for purpose, I agree with Jackson Carlow <coughs> on that, but successive government ministers have hidden behind the MHRA, using it as a shield, claiming that, that because medical devices are reserved, that this prevented the Scottish Government from acting. Today that claim is exposed as the bogus smokescreen we all knew it was. All of the steps announced today have been suggestions made by the MESH survivors for years. So will the Cabinet Secretary confirm that the procedure she has put in place today now brings Scotland into line with what's happening in the rest of the UK already? Will she confirm that the claims made last month in the media by the Chief Medical Officer about Scotland's more robust system were wholly misleading? Does she accept the Cabinet Secretary, does the Cabinet Secretary accept that the independent review into MESH was indeed a whitewash? And when will the review of the review be published? Does the Cabinet Secretary have that on her desk? Does she accept that the campaigners' demands have been right all along? And will she now, in very clear and unambiguous terms without ducking the question, accept that the evidence available in 2014 was stark and more than enough to have allowed consecutive cabinet secretaries to take the action that she has taken today, prevent many more women from being horribly injured or leading a life of anxiety and uncertainty. And finally, how will today's, today's decision and the implications of it be communi communicated to all past and present MESH patients? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much. Um, I thank Mr Finlay for those comments. Can I just make a point about what I mean by mature reflection? I don't expect anybody else in this chamber other than those who have held this post as Cabinet Secretary for Health to uh, feel sorry for the job I have to do. It is a brilliant job. However, it always involves the careful balance of evidence that comes from more than one source. And when in opposition, it is of course entirely your right and your responsibility to argue your case hard, but mature reflection requires that we recognise that whilst it is absolutely the case that very many women have been damaged by this procedure, you, Mr Finlay, will have received the email that I received only last week from a woman pointing out that no other procedure had helped her but this one. So it isn't possible to be so binary on some of these matters. What I have attempted to do today is listen to the voices of the women who have campaigned on this matter, look again at the evidence and decide whether or not there is more that we can do. And what I am not going to do is agree with you that our Chief Medical Officer was wholly misleading because she was not. Nor am I going to agree with you that what I have set out brings us into line with the rest of the UK because, in fact, it takes us ahead of the rest of the UK. We have taken steps beyond what the rest of the UK has done, and I have done that because I consider it proportionate and justifiable. The review of the review is independent 
I do not know when it will be published. It is certainly not on my desk at this point. And I expect that we will all know, broadly speaking, at the same time when it is published, and we will be able then to look at that matter. What I am trying to do today, as I said, is recognise the evidence that is before me, recognise the importance of clinical decision making, and that I, as a politician, like everyone else in this chamber, is not a, I'm not a clinician, and try to make the best possible decisions that I can for the safety and the care of our health service, and in particular, for those who come to it for that care and support. I believe that what I have set out today in this statement takes us in that direction. I am not closing the door to any further issues that may arise. We will, or will always be happy to look at that. But I think today we should be able to say that we have heard what the women have said and we have put in place steps that will ensure that, they, that any woman coming forward can be confident that she has given all the information she needs and the opportunity to make a fully informed and voluntary choice about what happens to her body. Alison Johnson to be followed by Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you. Um, I too welcome the Cabinet Secretary's announcement and I thank all those whose work has got us here, um, though I think it's fair to say that this halt is overdue. Can the Cabinet Secretary advise, um, in her statement she said that only where the women concerned have made the choice with full information, can she advise that a woman who chooses to go ahead with a transvaginal mesh implant, will she be informed of the decision that this government has taken today? And will she have an opportunity to meet with those whose experience has informed this decision? The woman that I met in Parliament said that their lives were limited because of incontinence. They were, they were limited, but they were not limited to the extent that they have to now use crutches, wheelchairs, that their relationships have been severely impacted. So I'd just like to understand what full information means. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, what, what we have done today is put in place a halt on the procedure, a halt, with the exception of those women currently with the treatment time guarantee in place, a very small number uh, that we have identified. And they too will be given the opportunity, in the light of what I have set out today, to determine whether they wish to go ahead with that uh, treatment. But that halt will only be lifted when we have absolute confidence that all the steps that I've outlined are in place, including that high vigilance protocol. And so at, the mo at this point, with the exception of those women who currently hold that treatment time guarantee, should they, in the light of all the circumstances and what I have set out, and they will be advised of that, wish to carry through with their procedure, with the exception of those, there will be no other procedures using MESH uh, as I have described it until we are certain that all the steps that, we've, that I've outlined are in place and we are confident that that is the case. And that will involve making sure that we can evidence uh, as fully as possible that, the, that any future woman coming forward where this is the uh, treatment option that is uh, presented to her that she has full information about what that option entails, what previous complications have been, what the uh, clinical advice is, what the alternatives to that may be, so that she can take time, uh, discuss it with her family before she makes a decision about what uh, she might best do. And in devising what that full information might be and how you would evidence that fully informed consent, then I am, of course, uh, open to having uh, propositions made to me from members in this chamber as well as groups uh, around the country. Alex Cole Hamilton to be followed by Alex Neil. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful for advance sight of the Cabinet Secretary's statement and very much uh, grateful for the contents it contains. Um, 
I have a constituent who has a, a hernia mesh problem. She's having to go to London to have that removed. I, I hope that in her answer, firstly, the Cabinet Secretary will cover what the touchstones of the review of hernia mesh will be and when that will be revisited. But secondly, what provision the NHS in Scotland will make for surgery to remove NA, um, mesh implants where it is appropriate to do so, and what consideration her government is considering for compensation for those survivors of the mesh implants. Cabinet Secretary. Um, um, thank you to Mr Cole Hamilton for his comments. Uh, in terms of uh, the use of mesh for other procedures than the two uh, or other conditions than the two that I have outlined, um, the halt that I have uh, advised the Chamber of today does not apply in, to those other uh, procedures because we have no evidence at this point that would justify uh, doing that, but we will keep that situation under review. And what I mean by under review is we will be um, reviewing constantly whether there is evidence coming forward from our boards, uh, internationally or otherwise, that suggests that we should look to take different steps uh, in, the, in those circumstances. Uh, in terms of um, arrangements for removing uh, uh, mesh, as, as Mr Cole Hamilton uh, asked, uh, I cannot answer him that, uh, give him an answer to that in detail today, but I'm happy to get back to him on that question. And with respect to uh, compensation, there is a procedure in place that uh, women, I am sure, are informed of, and we will certainly make sure that if they're not, they will be, uh, that they can pursue uh, in order to, to uh, have their case uh, considered uh, and determined whether or not they are due uh, financial compensation for a procedure that the health service has carried out. Thank you. I'm conscious there are at least 11 more members who wish to ask a question. This is a very uh, sensitive, in fact, a very emotional issue for many. Uh, I would just urge all members, all the front benches have had a chance to make a point. I would ask each member now to keep their questions succinct and the minister similarly in her answers. Alec Neil to be followed by uh, Miles Briggs. Thank you very much indeed, Presiding Officer. Can I too very much welcome the statement by the Cabinet Secretary? I think it lays out a clear direction of travel and at long last their foot is on the accelerator. Can I ask if the Cabinet Secretary is satisfied with the enforcement procedures within the National Health Service to ensure that this time her instructions are carried out in full, unlike what happened when I issued the suspension request uh, four years ago? And secondly, can I suggest that the three or four ministers of health, uh, currently three in the UK, get together and really agree a, a, a programme of action to deal with the MHRA. It is totally unfit for purpose. That's agreed by all parties. Any regulator funded by those who's regulating it is not fit for purpose, in my view. And also, any organisation that doesn't actually test devices before they authorise their use in the National Health Service is completely failing in their duty. And I think dealing with the MHRA, because this is not the only issue where they've failed patients across the UK, is a top urgent requirement if we are going to put an end to incidents and examples of devices being misused, as has happened in the case of MESH. Cabinet Secretary. <coughs> thank you. I thank Mr Neil for those comments. In terms of being satisfied about um, the, the, the instructions that have been issued today and the requirements that I have set out are being followed. Um, I, I've already set out what those procedures are, but uh, I am uh, interested in considering whether there is more that we need to do in order to ensure that that uh, halt is uh, adhered to and that, uh, and of course the halt, the halt is the halt and it is not lifted until I am satisfied that all the steps that I have put in place are in place and are understood and will be enacted. Um, so I think that gives some assurance, uh, I would hope so, uh, and we'll certainly look at whether or not there is more that we can do. In terms of UK Ministers uh, of Health, it's interesting because we have been discussing, I have been discussing uh, the opportunity uh, to invite my colleague Ministers for Health uh, to Scotland to discuss matters of common interest and we are likely to pursue that approach and in that uh, instance should we be successful and they accept the invitation then I'm very happy to include MHRA in that discussion. 
Miles Briggs to be followed by Emma Harper. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I certainly hope and sincerely hope that today is a step in the right direction in regaining the confidence of men and women across Scotland. Given the restricted use announced in the past and the instruction to halt today, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what guidance has also been issued to health boards about additional costs as associated with more complex treatments and procedures and this not forming part of any consideration? As it's clear that some health boards um, in the past since um, the announcement of restriction was made have carried on with their use, most notably Glasgow and Clyde, whereas other boards such as Grampian, Ayrshire and Arran and Tayside have completely stopped using them. Cabinet Secretary. Um, thank you. I'm grateful to Mr Briggs. Uh, in terms of, of instructions to health boards, well, as I said, the, the instruction from the Chief Medical Officer uh, has issued today as I was speaking, uh, advising uh, the halt of the use of this procedure with, as I said, the exception of those women who have the treatment time guarantee. Uh, in terms of bringing uh, the procedure back in any respect, I think I've outlined that. In terms of instructions to health boards about cost, what I have made very clear to health boards is that they should not be removing capacity uh, in any respect on the grounds of cost. Um, that, is, that is not my expectation of how they should uh, be delivering the services uh, in the name of the health service in Scotland. Uh, I'm, I will reflect a little on what Mr Briggs has said and look at the evidence for myself, but if I think that that may be a factor in a health board's decision about how it now enacts what we have set out, then I will make it clear to them that cost should not be a factor in their decisions about alternative treatments. Emma Harper to be followed by Anas Sarwar. I understand uh, from the statement that NICE are currently uh, carrying out a further review of the mesh. Can the Cabinet Secretary therefore confirm that the halt has been put in place? It will remain at least until the new guidance is completed. And how can you advise how members of the public can provide their views to this further review? Cabinet Secretary. Well, well the, the halt will certainly remain in place until I am satisfied that every one of the steps that I have outlined uh, are in place and will be followed uh, and that includes the, uh, the uh, uh, high vigilance protocol in terms of use. So the NICE guidelines as we expect them uh, shortly uh, to be consulted on will form part of that but they will not of themselves be the trigger for uh, any halt that we've put in place today to be lifted. They will inform that, but they won't be the trigger. In terms of how members of the public may uh, be involved in the consultation exercise, then we will make sure that on the government's website, on our website, we will put the necessary link there uh, for people uh, to follow in order to uh, provide their views in terms of consultation on those guidelines. And I would urge members then to make that available via their own channels to their own constituents. And ask our award to be followed by Stuart McMillan. <clears throat> Thank you, President Officer. In her statement, the Cabinet Secretary set out an exception to the ban, and that is for women who are currently waiting for a mesh procedure under the treatment time guarantee. Uh, that effectively means the Minister announcing a halt today yet a woman could technically undergo a mess procedure tomorrow. Um, so following on from the answer to Alison Johnson and giving the serious nature of the statement, will the Cabinet Secretary instruct the Chief Medical Officer to not only write to health boards setting out the new pr protocol, but also crucially write directly to all the women currently awaiting a mess procedure so they are fully aware of the new protocol being issued and have full knowledge of the situation, in essence giving them renewed and fully informed consent? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, um, I would um, think Mr. Sawa knows this, but of course, we do not hold the data on the women involved uh, who have the treatment time guarantee uh, for very obvious reasons. Each of the boards holds uh, that data, but I am perfectly happy to uh, ask all of the boards involved um, to contact the women, if they have any, in their board area who holds that current uh, treatment time guarantee to ensure that they are aware of what I have set out today uh, and also to ensure that they are aware of all the information that they should have um, in order uh, to make a decision about whether or not they want to go ahead with that treatment. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, presiding officer. I fully welcome the statement from the cabinet secretary today. And can, but the, can, can the cabinet secretary actually confirm if uh, this uh, effective ban will also extend to the use of prop devices by private healthcare uh, providers, or would this uh, be within the powers reserved to the MHRA and the UK Government? 
Cabinet Secretary. I'm, I'm grateful to Mr. McMillan. Um, we, we have the, the CMO, as well as writing uh, out, uh, as I have described, has included in that uh, a letter to the chief executives and medical directors of private healthcare providers, uh, advising them of the decisions that we've taken and the halt that we've put in place for the NHS, but that applies to the NHS. We cannot um, halt procedures in private healthcare. That would be uh, something that the MHRA would do uh, should they determine at some point uh, that these, this procedure or the use of this device uh, is not acceptable, but it is not something that I can do as the Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank the Member and the Ministers uh, for the contributions? And I'm sorry to have to cut this session off here, but we're already uh, six minutes over the time allocated. It's a, particularly, a subject of particular uh, sensitivity and interest. However, so is the following debate on suicide.